um, the first part of the title, a graphical approach to the journey to the story universe of the journey to the West. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the images I always share, which you can also find on the cover of the book that I will share at the end. Um, so let me see how can joke. Yes, C6 and 58, he wrote this poem, uh, Red Monkey, um, and he is also referring to uh, um, to, to Sunu Kung here. So he's also um, referring to the staff. Um, and the context he gives makes it very clear that he is here talking about Sunu Kung. So we have the song in the 21st century from last year. And then at the same time, we have this poem from the 14th century. So we have people who are divided by. So he's also. Um, referring to the staff. Um, and the context he gives makes it very clear that he is here talking about Sunu Kong. So we have the song in the 21st century from last year. And then at the same time, we have this poem from the 14th century. So we have people who are divided by how many years? 700 years, who are using the same story elements to express their feelings, right? And um, so this is just to give you an idea of the popularity of the journey to the West. Um, so over many hundreds of years, it is still alive. And now, of course, I mean, many of you might be familiar with the, with the black myth, right? The computer, the Chinese computer game that just came out and everybody is so gamers. No, there is nobody who doesn't know it. So perhaps that makes, so perhaps you can send me a smile, smiley if you have heard about the computer game. Yes. <laughs> That's good to see. Yeah. Um, so the journey to the West is very much alive. Um, and it was alive over many, many hundreds of years. Um, so there, are, of course, I mean, um, it's not only the journey to the West. Actually, what I try to do is not only uh, I use the journey to the West because it's so popular. Um, but we have other story universes or story clouds um, that uh, we are familiar with. Just to give you an example, I mean, Cinderella is probably one example, right? So there are many different versions um, of Cinderella. Then there are the Three Kingdoms, of course. There are games and un also unbelievable many versions of it. There is King Arthur, so it's not only something East Asian. Um, story worlds exist over uh, in the whole world. Um, there is, for example, also in, 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 in Japan, the Ise, the tales of Ise. Then Mulan is, of course, something that is also very uh, popular and adapted again and again in different media. Here, this is from uh, Genji, uh, the tales of Genji, also from Japan, right? Then uh, this is an example from Korea, Chunyang, probably one of the most famous uh, uh, story worlds in Korea. Hongyedong is another example. Beauty and the Beast, because I gave this talk be um, once in France, so I added <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. Don Quixote, for example, also. So just to give you an idea, so this talk is not only about the journey to the West. The journey to the West is only a case that I use kind of to understand how these story worlds um, survive. Um, yeah. Arguments of my books uh, are that literary classics like The Journey to the West grow as transmedial, transtemporal, transauthorial, transnational story clouds made up of versions. And I tried, I'm not so good with visualizing, but so uh, you can see here on the screen, you can see a cloud, right? Um, so you can, if you understand this cloud as a story cloud, then all these drops are different versions of it. So if we if you understand, for example, this is the story cloud of Cinderella, then each of these drops would be a different version. My, one might be a film, another might be like an animation and so on. So we have this cloud and the cloud, I, why I use the cloud is why, because I think that these story clouds are very dynamic. They are not static. They There are new versions coming in all the time. Some of the versions are forgotten. So the cloud is always changing the form. Um, yeah, 
but it's of course very trans uh, problematic. These arguments, um, not everybody agrees, and that's totally fine. So it's kind of rather than an argument, I just suggest understanding the journey to the West in this way uh, to see a bit more. Um, perhaps to uh, make clear what I want to say here with the transmedial, I mean, it's we can find the journey to the West in different media. We just saw the journey to the West is referred to in music videos, but it is also, we have many poems of the journey to the West. We have mask dance, as you will see later on, I will give you some cases. Um, then I also argue that the journey to the West is transtemporal. That means we cannot really reduce it to one time. Uh, I know that there are, if you look at literary histories, then uh, you will see, oh, The Journey to the West. That's a Chinese novel from 1592. Um, I uh, suggest understanding The Journey to the West and the uh, as a story cloud in which the novel from 1592 is only one version because this, uh, what you find in literary history is from 1592, this novel is only, um, uh, there are many things that we, that are not part of it. Some episodes are missing and so on. Um, so I understand all these versions of Journey to the West as something that is living. Um, then I also suggest understanding the Journey to the West as trans-authorial, um, because we see here um, the first video was by the band 17. So they would be the producers of the song, let's say, Uh, and then we had the poem that was Isek. So we can see in the story cloud, many authors are um, included or involved. And then what is extremely difficult is uh, to sell this as a transnational. So when we talk about world literature and for example, also um, there was Damos in his, what is world literature in his book where he says, world literature is literature that travels. Um, and when, but the problem is that when we talk about story or when we define story clouds as transnational, then national masterpieces kind of lose their value because you cannot reduce one story to one country. Um, and as we know, all countries have these kind of nationalistic or patriotic feelings where they say, this is our masterpiece. And if you just say, oh, this is actually very transnational, then uh, these kind of the value of masterpieces might be um, in danger. So if I go, for example, to Japan and say, oh, the tales of Genji is actually transnational, it's not only Japanese, there might be many people who disagree, right? And also with the journey to the West, uh, when I say, okay, it's not, there is, there are Chinese versions, but are, there are also all other versions around the world. It's kind of, sometimes it's very, um, it's dangerous. <laughs> so um, I'm, I think, you can see that there are trends, 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 trends. If whenever we use the term trends, it kind of suggests movement, right? So not sta uh, there's nothing static, it's dynamic. So there is something uh, changing all the time, but at the same time, there is something that stays stable. So there seems to be some kind of essence, but at the same time, this essence is changing kind of the form. So that's why I came up with this dynamic essence, which is I'm kind of, uh, uh yeah to 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 um, to emphasize the tension that we have here um and then so what i said also before that um uh, traditionally these literary classics um like the tale of genji or king arthur are perceived as static works with one original that's very important and we all tend to We have this longing, I think it's very human, that we want to have this one original. Uh, we want one single author, a precise date of publication and a clear nationality. And what is so funny about the journey to the West is that we actually don't really know who the author is, even not the author of the novel from 1592. Um, but then even library catalogs do not allow to leave the author out. So if there is an anonymous author, Uh, still in the in libraries, they have to enter uh, an author. And um, this is, there's also one German, I will just, there's one German translation of the journey to the West here. Um, and uh, here the author makes very clear that it's not, uh, that we don't 
who the author of the journey to the west is um and she also on the copyright page she doesn't mention an author but in the library catalogs, this is still categorized as Wu Chang'an as the author, although the translator says she doesn't know who the author is. Um, and this is kind of very much based, this uh, longing to understand uh, literary classics as stated works is very much based in reception studies, what we call reception studies. Um, so there, it's not only me, there is a whole, uh, there are many researchers who try to find a way out of reception studies. Um, and I think when we think about these kind of story worlds, it becomes very clear that they are not stated. Uh, but it's very difficult to find a way out um, because, and I think one reason is that it's so difficult to grasp story clouds. Um, and then one of my, uh, one of the, yeah, the, the main motivations for my whole project was to find ways to make these story clouds graspable. Um, yeah, and so it's not only me who says story universes are ungraspable. It's, for example, if you're interested in transmedia storytelling, there's Henry Jenkins who said that um, story universes are bottomless texts and they are impossible for any one consumer to get it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so my kind of task was to make story clouds. How is it possible to get these story clouds that have a dynamic essence? Um, and what I will do today is uh, I will first give you a short uh, introduction to the journey to the West. Um, I will then talk a little bit about my uh, theoretical struggles. Um, so finding an alternative out of reception studies. And then I will show you some of my attempts to visualize the story cloud of the journey to the West. Um, perhaps, oh yeah, we could do the smiley exercise again. Uh, have you, please send me some kind of emoji if you have heard of the journey to the West before. <laughs> nice. If is there anybody who has never heard about the journey to the west? That's also fine. <laughs> so I guess you have you're all familiar with the journey to the west. So I will keep it short. But please uh, ask if there is anything unclear. Um, so the journey to the west is quite is uh, is circulating all over the world, uh, especially in East Asia. Uh, here it's just uh, the translations or the pronunciation of uh, Xi Ji in, so in Chinese and Japanese and Korean, Vietnamese. Um, in my book, I tried to avoid reducing the journey to the West to one nation. Uh, I just call the journey to the West the journey. So I might also do that in the presentation. But when I say the journey, um, then I'm referring to the journey to the West. Um, and here you can see the cover page of one of uh, uh, the one of the um, uh, one of the best known English translations. This is a translation, so it's said to be a translation of um, the Journey to the West from the novel from 1592 that I mentioned before by Anthony Yu. Um, and on the cover page we see the main protagonists. We see the monk in the middle. Then, of course, we see the monkey, Sun Wukong. Um, so when I give this talk to students, many are not familiar with but everybody knows Dragon Ball, right? So that's why I also use Goku here. And then students say, oh, that's Goku. Yeah, now I know. So we have uh, the monkey. Then we have uh, also a pig here. We can see Juba Jie and Tripit Alia, the monk, and also another monkey. Uh, another another monster, Sha Wu Jing. Um, what is so interesting about this translation is that Anthony Yu says, oh yeah, uh, the my, uh, primary source text is the novel from 1592, but actually if you look at it, he's referring of a Chinese, to a, a Chinese, uh, to a modern Chinese translation that is again based on four, five, six different other source texts. So it's basically a patchwork. Uh, that he used as source texts. And uh, for example, there is one episode uh, about the monk's childhood 
that is missing in, in, the, in the novel from 1592, and it's part of this English translation, and nobody cares. <laughs> um, yeah, so the journey to the West actually starts with a little, uh, like, um, uh, with a story of the monkey, and before the real journey to the West, a bit later. So here we have, we can see the monkey, um, the journey to this starts with uh, the birth of uh, Sunu Kung, the monkey out of a stone. Um, and then uh, we can see kind of his career. So first he becomes the king of all monkeys. Uh, so becomes more and more powerful. Um, then uh, it also becomes clear that he's so powerful that he has really no enemy. Nobody can really fight him. Um, so he, uh, he also he dreams of becoming uh, immortal. Uh, he finds also his weapon. And so there are all kinds of, of episodes at the beginning that tells us how he becomes more and more powerful. Um, and then he realizes that he really has no enemy. Um, or at least this is what he believes. So he becomes very arrogant. Um, and even the Jade Emperor, who is at that time, or who is uh, portrayed as the highest authority in heaven, doesn't know how to deal with monkey. Um, and then there's only one person the Jade Emperor thinks can help, and that's Buddha. And this is also um, related to the scene. So um, the, the Jade Emperor asks Buddha, and Buddha comes and talks to the monkey and asks him, so let's make a deal. If you manage to jump out of my palm, then the universe belongs to you. But if you don't manage, then you will be imprisoned for I don't know how many hundreds of years. And then, of course, the monkey said, oh, ha, 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 that's easy. I can jump to the end or beyond the universe. So he starts uh, jumping and then he sees these pillars. And of course, we know they are fingers, right? They are Buddha's fingers. But in the story, it's um, said that um, Sun Wukong doesn't know, so he thinks it's kind of the, the pillars at the end of the universe. So what he does is he writes his title, at, uh, or he inscribes his name into one of the pillars, and then he even pees against one, uh, and is kind of very confident that now the universe belongs to him, jumps back, and then Buddha opens his hand, uh, and Monkey realizes that he has never left the palm of Buddha. Uh, so he is imprisoned in, uh, uh, for, I don't know, 800 years or so. Um, and then meanwhile, so while he is still imprisoned, the real journey or the preparations for the real journey starts. So um, there is uh, some bodhisattvas try to find uh, a monk who can travel to the West, to India, to find the real Buddhist scriptures. And we know, so historically, there are there were many monks who traveled to India from China, but also from 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 Korea, um, to get uh, the real Buddhist scriptures and then to translate them. So there is kind of uh, historical elements in this. Um, yeah. So this kind of Buddhist community tries to find a monk who can travel, and then they say, oh, but he needs somebody who can protect him. And then uh, they say, okay, this has to be the monkey because he is so powerful. And they say, ah, oh, but he is still in prison. So the monk first frees the monkey. Um, he goes uh, to the mountain where the monkey is imprisoned. Then he frees him. Um, but of course, everybody knows that the monkey is very, so he doesn't listen to anyone. Um, and to avoid that uh, the monkey just runs away, he gets this kind of what is often portrayed as a crown or a headband. So he gets this, um, and whenever he doesn't listen to the monk, um, this starts to hurt. So, and then they also have these other disciples, the, the pig and also the monster, and then the, uh, the journey starts. Um, and actually, the journey is extremely repetitive. So what happens, we have around 30 episodes. It's always, so the pilgrims, the monk and his disciples, they encounter Sun Wukong, the monkey, comes up with a plan. Then the hindrances are overcome, and the pilgrims happily continue the journey. 
um, they make uh, they meet different monsters on the way, but more or less it's always the same. There's again like a hindrance or a monster, and everything. Oh, now the journey is over. We will never be able to continue. And then Sun Kong comes up with a plan. Sometimes he also has Buddhist or Taoist helpers, and then the journey continues. And this happens again and again. Uh, and then the spoiler at the end, of course, they arrive in the West, they get the Buddhist script scriptures, they attain enlightenment, and it's like the best happy end ever. Um, yeah, so uh, so there is a pattern of the episodes in the journey to the West. And because it's so repetitive, many translations actually leave out many episodes. So we have also one uh, translation by Arthur Whaley, just titled The Monkey, or just titled Monkey. And I think he only includes four of the 30 episodes. Um, yeah, so there's an app, so the, the episodes, it's possible to read the journey to the West without reading all of these episodes. Um, and here, this is, I will, perhaps I will share this also in the chat. There is this chat here. Um, so you can also check. So this is what is the journey. Um, I also have it here. Um, of course, it's very difficult to define what the journey is because there are so many versions. And of course, in Chi there are so many Chinese versions, Japanese versions, but also English versions and so on. Um, just to make, uh, to let you know what, what I kind of uh, worked with, I had uh, I made this very simple database together with um, a programmer um, and used 60 variations, 60 Korean variations of the journey uh, that you can find here. You can see I made also this categorization into translations, adaptations, and intertexts. If you are interested in this, uh, I can talk about this later. Um, here you can see so intertext, adaptations, and uh, translations. And if you, with your cursor, if you go over them, you can see a little bit more bibliography, uh, bibliographical data. Um, so the earliest are from the 14th century. I couldn't, so I couldn't include the the song from 2023. Um, because then my book was, I already submitted the manuscript. <laughs> um, but there are also um, um, variations of, uh, from the 21st century. Um, yeah, and so I worked with 60. I tried to include as many as possible, but then at the same time, I didn't stress myself too much because the idea is not, because it's dynamic. Um, I do not have the expectation to be able to find everything, right? And uh, yeah, so just to give you an idea, I work with them. And now I'm going back to my PowerPoint here. So the th theoretical, my theoretical, yeah, it's, I call it frame, but it's more like the struggles I had. So I struggled a lot uh, to find an alternative to reception studies. So at the beginning, um, yeah, I will choose those. At the beginning, I actually, I started with the reception studies because it's so easy, right? Here, I mean, this is more or less what reception studies, uh, how we imagine reception studies. So there is one original. Um, and if we compare this one original to a stone, right, then the waves, is what reception is, right? So if you throw a stone into the water, you have the waves and the waves would be reception. But then very, um, so I, at the beginning, I used the novel from 1592 that many people do. And then I thought everything that comes afterwards is um, the reception. And it would have made my life so much easier. And I thought, okay, I will go that way. I go the easy way. But then I found so many versions of the journey to the West before 1592 and I thought hmm what should I do <laughs> should I just ignore them and many actually there are many um, researchers, uh, researchers in Korea who are working on the reception of the journey to the west and uh, the basic trend is 
leaving out everything that comes before 1592. But then I have the poem and there is also a pagoda later on uh, that you will see. And I think I cannot really leave it out. Um, so I somehow had to leave exception studies and I realized that it, I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, there is Kwon Hyok Chan, who also published a book last year, I think. Um, and his dissertation, this book is based on his dissertation. It's about the three kingdoms. And then instead of uh, reception, he's using domestication and appropriation. So I'm just showing you these kind of terms so to show you that it's not only me who's kind of struggling with these, with leaving the frame of reception studies. Then we have Joshua Mosto, um, who worked on the ESA stories. Um, and he also said that, okay, reception is actually too passive. Uh, so he plays with the term cultural appropriation, which of course causes other problems. Um, then there is Gagana Ivanova, um, uh, a student of Mosto, who says attempts to limit classical texts to a specific origin, definite, definitive version of singular meaning lead to misconceptions that suppress the many functions that such texts have performed over time. Um, and then this is also an amazing book. Uh, you might be familiar with it, The Global White Snake by Liang Luo, who says that rather than taking a Sinocentric approach and treating the English, Japanese, Korean and other uh, iterations of the legends as derivative and of lesser importance, this study focusing on uh, the travels of the legends in multiple directions. So she is already taking it for granted that it's, it's, um, and she does not even uh, bother with the frames of reception studies, right? She is, so this is an amazing book too. And then of course there is uh, um, Idema who wrote, this is only one example. He wrote about many legends and also the different versions, uh, versions of legends. Um, um, yeah, so I learned a lot from him and it's interesting that he also at some point says, so this is not his focus, but he also said very often the origins are very difficult to define. Um, so, and then there was the book that really helped me a lot by Michael Emrich about the, the tale of, of Genji. Uh, who says, so we need a new terminology away from, um, from a focus on supposedly stable classic texts themselves and what an interest in the mutable history of books and other material forms. And then he says, so we should leave reception behind and engage more with the no notion of replacement. Um, yeah, so this is revolutionary. So he says, when we imagine again this cloud with all these different versions, that each of the versions can replace the whole story. And Emily goes so far that he says, so there was an uh, anniversary uh, tale of Genji um, anniversary several years ago. 